and is ready to yank the rug out underneath what, as you've described, is a 49-year protection that was not a close decision, a seven to two opinion, with five of those justices being Republican appointed and Justice Blackman, who wrote the opinion in Roe, being placed on the court by Richard Nixon. So what we see is completely antithetical to Republican history, uh, Prescott Bush being the treasurer of Planned Parenthood. Uh, we are seeing a time that for people who are articulating being afraid of what these times represent, they should be and count not just the attack on abortion because next will be attacks on contraception. They're already happening. We already saw that in the Hobby Lobby case. And we're already seeing attacks on sex education in schools as well. Uh, joining our conversation now is Neil Katyal. Uh, Neil is joining us from London. There's a time zone uh, stress here, and I want to get Neil in as quickly as we can. Uh, uh, Neil, uh, w in your reading of, of this 98-page decision, uh, is there anything in it that's, that says Congress should stay out of this? The Supreme Court, it says, we have no role in this because it should be left to the states. But is the Supreme Court saying Congress should stay out of this, too, because it should be left to the states? Uh, no, they're not quite saying that. And so it's perfectly possible, Lawrence, that a reaction to this you know, draft opinion, which is something I've been calling for for three years, Cecile, others have, is a law of Congress that codifies the rights of Roe versus Wade above and beyond anything the court can do or take away or something like that. Um, but that's going to require a majority vote in the House and Senate. I think that they should break the filibuster over it. I think this is, you know, the, if this draft opinion becomes the law, it is the hugest step back for women in decades, for reproductive justice and for reproductive freedom. And here, I think Lawrence is the most telling fact in this opinion, draft opinion, if it does become the law, it upholds the Mississippi law. And the Mississippi law had no exception for rape or incest. So it's just a flat ban. And so if Mississippi's A-OK, -okay, any other state can do that. Or possibly, Lawrence, you, you know, if there were a Republican takeover of the House and Senate, Congress could pass a law banning abortion in all 50 states. So this is a dramatic holding uh, if it becomes the law of the Supreme Court. It's breathtaking. Um, and I understand the need to, to want, all of us want to talk about other things about the court, voting rights and so on. But on this day, I think, you know, what we should focus on Roe versus Wade just because this is monumental in a way that nothing like this has happened in our lifetimes. Uh, Neil, just a quick follow up on the, uh, this is a draft opinion. What are the kinds of changes that normally occur uh, between a draft opinion, and this one was drafted in February, uh, an opinion that might come out uh, as late as June, what kinds of changes happen? So changes can happen of all sorts, Lawrence, big and small. One other justice who, you know, can say, hey, you know, instead, Justice Alito, you should, you know, drop that footnote or add a paragraph that says this or delete a whole section. And possibly you can even have a justice switch opinion and say, you know, I voted initially after oral argument to totally uphold the Mississippi law and join Justice Alito. But now I think that's not true um, and join what would be the dissenters. The problem here is that Chief Justice Roberts would be that most likely person who would, you know, so-called switch sides. But his vote doesn't matter anymore because after Justice Ginsburg passed away and was, was replaced by Justice Barrett, Justice, uh, ju the Chief Justice became the sixth vote, not the fifth. And so you'd need to get one of the justices like Justice Barrett to flip her view uh, from the conference, and that's unlikely. And that's why, you know, that, you know, I think there's a lot of doom and gloom going on right now after looking at this draft opinion. And yes, it's possible that things could change, but it's really quite unfortunately unlikely. Uh, I want to go back to another Supreme Court hearing, and that is Brett Kavanaugh's. And we all remember uh, that Senator Susan Collins staked her vote to confirm uh, Justice Kavanaugh on her belief that Justice Kavanaugh would uphold Roe versus Wade, and her belief was based on what he had to say in his confirmation hearing. Let's listen to that. Have your views on whether Roe is settled precedent or could be overturned? And, and has your views changed since you were in the Bush White House? Senator, I um, said that it's settled as a precedent of the Supreme Court entitled to respect under principles of stare decisis. And one of the important things to keep in mind about Roe v. Wade is that it has been 
reaffirmed many times over the past uh, 45 years, as you know. And uh, most prominently, most importantly, reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992. And as you well recall, Senator, I know uh, when that case came up, the Supreme Court didn't just reaffirm it uh, in passing. The court specifically went through all the factors of stare decisis in considering whether to overrule it. And the joint opinion of Justice Kennedy, Justice O'Connor, and Justice Souter at great length went through that, those factors. That was the question presented in the case. Cecile Richards, that's what Susan Collins's confidence was based on. Look, I mean, I, I, we could we could go over that um, hearing again, and obviously this is that was that was devastating. The, the you know having Kevin on the court is, but the truth is we have to look ahead now, and I think what is um, what is so uh, distressing. This is now five people in the United States of America who've now are poised to take away the right of every single woman in this country. I think as Rachel said earlier, this is something we've never seen before. This is a right that all of us have lived our entire lives being able to exercise. And that is the most fundamental right to make a decision about your pregnancy. This isn't about whether how you feel about abortion. It is about do you want the government to make these decisions for every single person in this country? That's what they have just done. No exceptions, as Neil said. This is this is a devastating opinion. If this should should actually come to pass, and it is going to change the lives and opportunities of every single person uh, in a, in America. And it didn't happen. It did not happen because the American people rose up and said we need to make abortion illegal. It happened because the Republican Party has been 100% committed to ending legal abortion for years, and they just did that. And if people don't wake up and understand, this is a political battle. This is not about the Supreme Court. This is about one party taking away the right of over half this country, and we better get serious about fighting back. Professor have uh, really run a, a long march through the institutions, uh, and their theory is very simple. We get our people into the institutions, we change those institutions from within, we violate democratic norms, We've, we go in an anti-democratic process uh, simply by dominating the bureaucracies. They believe they can do the same thing with the courts as they've done to universities and other prestige institutions. Uh, and unfortunately, to a certain extent, it's working. That's why conservatives have to adapt. We have to come up with new strategies and tactics to start pushing back on the left's institutional dominance uh, before they're really taking this democratic shell and then putting whatever they want inside. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's become their pattern, and it's by any means necessary. They'll, whatever they have to do, whether it's ripping down a statue or or smashing of Andy No in the head, or you know, or blowing up uh, sex education in school and turning it into something very different, they'll do it and then they'll say, "Oh, you're an outlier for complaining about it." That's happening tonight with this leak at the court. And Kurt, this uh, this 2019 um, uh, New York Times piece reminded everybody that back in the 80s. It was Senator Joe Biden, who's supposedly a devout Catholic, voted to let states overturn Roe versus Wade. So that's just that is a pretty good indicator, is it not, Kurt, of how far the Democrat Party has shifted to the most radical partial birth abortion, abortion on demand position on this one of many cultural issues. Well, I'm not surprised at all, Laura. Uh, they've been going more extreme and more extreme and more extreme over the years. Uh, right now, we have a uh, Supreme Court nominee uh, who wouldn't uh, admit that she knew what a woman was. Uh, where well, she's not a nominee, she's doors. a she's an she is she is a new justice on the Supreme Court. She's an associate oh, yeah, justice. Yeah, well, she's not a nominee true. anymore. And, Wishful and, thinking, there, buddy. Yeah, and notably not a biologist. Look. Um, Ingreza 80 milligram is proven to reduce TD movements in seven and years ahead with Fidelity Income Planning. And love doing it with fun and bold dresses. Top eight steps for um, Air Force um, service members. Um, you have to take 48 steps to do the formal dispute process, um, which is unacceptable. 
You can start, stop, or adjust your plan at any time. Worth remembering because we're talking about confirmation hearings, and Michelle makes this really important point. It's not just abortion. It was Justice Barrett who wouldn't say that Griswold versus Connecticut, that is the, the case that gave the foundational right to use birth control within marriage. She wouldn't say that that was a good precedent of the court. And so I think this really important point that Michelle makes, which is the whole bucket of rights here, it's not just abortion. We were hearing at the Katanji Brown Jackson confirmation hearings, whispers about getting rid of Griswold, whispers about getting rid of Burgafell, and even uh, not in the hearings, but talk of getting rid of, of loving the anti-miscegenation case. So anyone who is fooled by the rhetoric in this opinion that this stops at Roe, I think fails to understand that Roe, the underpinning of Roe is the underpinning of so many other vitally important liberties. And I think it's really, really important to see the scope of this, as Neil says, not just for women today, it's a catastrophe, but for all the kind of privacy, family autonomy, bodily autonomy rights that we also have taken for granted for way too long. Uh, Neil Katyal, uh, pick up on Dahlia's point. What might be the next to fall? Uh, could we lose uh, the right to contraception? Could that be left up to the states? Yeah, so Dahlia is exactly right. I mean, it's the same family and the same basic underlying constitutional uh, protections. And, you know, conservatives have derided it, calling it a penumbra and not the right to privacy not being in the Constitution. That's what the Bork Supreme Court hearings are all around. I'd also say Lawrence gay marriage. You know, the Supreme Court just guaranteed marriage equality just a few years ago. That's obviously been a target of the conservatives. And if they can overrule this case, Roe versus Wade, which is kind of this most precedent case ever. It's the case, Lawrence, that three Republican justices in 1992, Kennedy, O'Connor, and Souter, said uh, that that's the case that social expectations had crystallized around Roe versus Wade. And so even if it were wrong, you can't overrule it because it would damage the court's legitimacy. They did it here. So if they can do it here, unfortunately, they can do it anywhere. And that is the threat tonight. So we are back now with our breaking news here on CNN. Politico has obtained what it calls a draft of a majority opinion written by Justice Samuel Alito that would strike down Roe v. Wade. Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota joins me now. Senator, good evening to you. Thank you so much for joining us. First of all, what is your reaction to this massive news? Uh, it's unbelievable. And I will say uh, none of us know what the final opinion will be. Uh, things change. And again, this is just breaking news. Um, but I will say that I predicted this uh, in my questions of Amy Coney Barrett way back then when she would not commit that uh, Roe v. Wade was super precedent uh, to uh, the predictions after the um, court arguments that, in fact, uh, this court has been stacked and they are doing something where they are completely breaking with precedent if all of this uh, news that we're hearing is correct. And I want to talk about the result, Don, because if this opinion is issued, it will be against the wishes of 80 percent of Americans who believe that women should have the right to make the health, their own health care system. It would trigger the laws in over 20 states mm -hmm. that have already said uh, that they will outlaw abortion in their states. It will create a patchwork of laws across the country. And my prediction, Don, is that it will drive women to the polls and men anyone, that 80 percent of the public, who believes that health care decisions should be made by a woman and her doctor and not by Ted Cruz. Yeah. Um, so yeah. this is going to have major impact Senator, if all of this down as it looks. I want to talk about the impact, but let's, uh, the, the, your earlier point, and then we'll get back to the impact because it is huge, but you mentioned your uh, questioning of Amy Coney Barrett and others. So this is, I want to play that. This is what Trump's Supreme Court nominees were asked about abortion, and this is how they answered. Watch this. Is Roe a super precedent? How would you define super precedent? And I'm answering a lot of questions about Roe, which I think indicates that Roe doesn't fall in that category. And scholars across the spectrum say that doesn't mean that Roe should be overruled. But descriptively, it does mean that it's a case, not a case that everyone has accepted and doesn't call for its overruling. As a judge, it is an important precedent of the Supreme Court. By it, I mean Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey been reaffirmed many times. Casey is precedent on precedent. 
which itself is an important factor. Senator, as the book explains, um, the Supreme Court of the United States has held in Roe versus Wade that um, a fetus is not a person for purposes of the 14th Amendment. And the book explains that. Do you accept that? That's the law of the land. I accept the law of the land, Senator, yes. Wow. So, yeah, <laughs> you, and you, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. What do you think of the responses? What do you think of, of their, were they telling the truth in that moment? Well, when they're saying it's the law of the land, and they uh, arguably use this to convince certain senators uh, to vote for them, um, I think that is a major problem. They said it was the law of the land. Um, they are talking about the fact that it's been affirmed time and time again. Um, and that's why I think a lot of people are shocked. I will tell you that I'm not shocked because I, you could see this in the way the questioning went and the willingness, as you know, Don, in the Texas case, a different case, to actually in a shadow docket, no briefings, no public hearings, where they actually allowed a abortion ban to go forward uh, that also include a bounty hunter provision, uh, which allowed citizens to go after each other. Um, I, it is an unbelievable uh, shift in court decisions. And so I am, of course, as a member of the U.S. Senate, um, who someone believes that Roe v. Wade should be codified into law so we don't have a patchwork of state laws and we protect women from back alley abortions and bus rides across the country mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. to make their own personal health care decisions. Or across uh, borders. I'm someone that believes, I believe the Senate needs to act and act now. Yeah, or across borders. But let me just read this and I want to get your response to it because you talked about uh, the, the ramifications uh, of this and the fallout. And this is what a source is uh, uh, telling CNN, that Roberts does not want to completely overturn Roe v. Wade, meaning apparently it would be a dissenting, he would be dissenting from Alito's draft opinion, likely with the court's three liberals, sources tell CNN. Roberts is willing, however, to uphold the Mississippi law that would ban abortion at 15 weeks after conception, CNN has learned. Under uh, current law, government cannot interfere with a woman's choice to terminate a pregnancy before uh, about 23 weeks when a fetus could live outside the wound. And I wanted to read that because I want to get this exactly right. So what do you make Roberts not wanting to completely overturn Roe v. Wade? Well, I think, um, first of all, I don't know where all this is coming from. And I do think leaks from the court are disturbing. Um, but beyond that, I think that Justice Roberts has signaled uh, not just in the uh, the case before us with Mississippi, but in other cases, time and time again, a recent environmental case uh, where he uh, publicly came out against using the shadow docket, his um, um, upholding of the Affordable Care Act, the refusal to strike it down uh, when looking at the law. He has clearly shown a sense of independence. I don't know what he's going to do in this case, but I think what your viewers have to understand is if, in fact, these five ultra-conservative justices um, do something like we've seen in this leak or that Politico is reporting, whatever Justice Roberts does, well, important to know where he's headed, uh, is not relevant because that's a 5-4 decision if, in fact, they all uh, go against uh, what many of them had said in the past, like the law of the land and that it's been reaffirmed many times, so it's precedent, and overturn uh, this decades and decades long precedent. Yeah. Senator Amy Klobuchar, thank you so much. I appreciate you jumping in here to uh, speak to us about this. And we heard you. We heard you on, on the long-term ramifications and it, your question. It is huge. And you have Republicans wanting to put a six-week ban in already, yeah. as you know. Yeah. That's what we're dealing with here. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. I want to bring in now Congressman Gregory Meeks of New York. Had a Sioux Falls hit himself by retiring after a 45-year career. We'll have his story from O'Gorman on tonight's Eye on Kettleland at 10. Gently used. The, the government to do anything that they shouldn't be doing. We're just asking them to do what they should be doing. And we're, not, we're not asking for an apology. We're not asking for uh, exoneration. Just do your Getting a mortgage can be scary, so when people tell me technology, now the police will say, "Oh, we use the latest technology, and we have our own DNA, uh, DNA experts." They don't. The FBI admitted they don't have it. They don't have the latest stuff. They said you have to go to an outside 
and lab of which there's probably less than three or four in the country that be a leader because if you know what the citizens of this county deserve better and as we saw at thursday's town hall in orlando republican governors like ron desantis are fighting back with success even against some big corporations so I want everyone to do well, but I am not comfortable having one company with their own government and special privileges when that company has pledged itself to attacking the parents in my state. When that company, when that company has very high up people talking about injecting pansexualism into programming for young kids, it's wrong. Walt Disney would not want that. And so get back to the mission. Do what you did great. That's why people love the company and you've lost your way. Maybe this will be the wake up call that they need to get back on track. I, I never got a chance to see that uh, recorded. That was, pretty, that was pretty wild. But the White House, think about that. They're fresh out of ideas. So what they've decided to do is to wind up old Biden and send him out to snap back aggressively. Today, there are too many politicians trying to score political points, trying to ban books, even math books. I mean, did you ever think, even your younger teachers, did you ever think when you'd be teaching, you'd be worrying about book burnings and banning books? All because it doesn't fit somebody's political agenda. we got to stop making the target of the culture wars. <laughs> Maybe Joe was sleeping over the past, I don't know, 40 years. But his loyalists succeeded in removing wife to solve it unless he asks for help. What I'd like to say state, make no mistake about it. They say it's about states' rights, but it's not. It is about taking away the right of women to make their own decision about pregnancy, and they will not stop. Wendy Davis, uh, th this is the product of our politics, a vote for Republicans at every level, state legislature, governor, senator, uh, president, has produced this decision. This is a, a Republican political success. This is one of the only policies they've been running on for decades, and now they have basically uh, realized that policy through the Supreme Court, created by Republican presidents, uh, President, uh, the first President Bush, second President Bush, and President Trump. Their nominees are all doing this uh, to the American people tonight. They're all delivering this decision. Uh, one of the things that I believed when I was working in the United States Senate with Republicans is that the overwhelming majority of Republican senators did not believe their own personal rhetoric about abortion, and they never expected to have to deliver on it in any way, and they expected to profit on fundraising over resistance to Roe versus Wade for the rest of their political lives. Uh, they are now going to have to live uh, with the success of this, what does this mean uh, to Republican politics in Texas? Well, it's going to be really fascinating to see what it means, Lawrence, and you're exactly right. I served in the Texas Senate with Republican senators who absolutely supported abortion rights and yet voted time and time again for laws that intruded upon those rights. And I think that lawmakers across this country and at the federal level have always believed that the court would continue to be a backstop. But with Donald Trump's appointments on the Supreme Court and with Mitch McConnell's U.S. Senate affirming those appointees to the Supreme Court, it changed the game. And now Republicans, for all of their rhetoric, are going to have to face a voting backlash on this issue. Here's the real challenge, though, Lawrence. Because the Supreme Court has also dramatically curtailed voting rights, and because gerrymandering has become so extreme in state after state after state, even though the majority of people in states like the one that I live in disagree that Roe v. Wade should be overturned, absolutely support a person's right to make a decision about their own body, even though a majority of voters believe that, the deck is so stacked against them because of the way these districts are drawn to favor a majority of Republicans who are out of step 
with what they care about and who are only concerned about the few voters in their Republican primaries who are putting them into office. What that means is that statewide elections, like the one we have coming up in Texas in November for Beto O'Rourke and other people down the ballot statewide, those elections have just taken on a new and incredible importance because redistricting cannot impact what happens in a statewide vote. And I hope that that will be our rallying cry in state after state after state, that we are going to do everything we can to elect statewide leaders who will make sure that in our states, this is not going to stand. And as Cecile said, if Republicans take control of Congress, we can say goodbye to states being able to do anything about it at all. So the stakes in the federal election in November just got even higher. And if that means that we have to fight like hell and do everything we can to make sure that we hold the House in November and that we not only hold the Senate, but we increase the number of Democratic senators there, then we've got to do everything we can to make that happen. Our rage will do us no good if we don't follow it with that kind of concrete action. Cecile Richards, uh, as we go forward here, uh, one thing that I think has always been a struggle for Democrats is to link voting to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, as a voting issue for president, the Supreme Court as a voting issue for the Senate, which of course uh, confirms Supreme Court justices. Uh, if this doesn't clarify that for voters, nothing will. I, I understand um, what you're saying, Lawrence, and, and agree. It, it is a challenge, but the fact of the matter, the, the five justices on the Supreme Court were put there by Mitch McConnell uh, not only Mitch McConnell, but by the Republican Party, three of these justices put on by Donald Trump, who pledged to overturn Roe versus Wade. And all the state laws we're seeing, you know, Wendy talking about the, the, the horrific things happening in Texas, these happened because of Republican governors and Republican legislators. That to me is all we need to motiv motivate voters in November, because there is one consistent thread. If you look at the states, Oklahoma, Kentucky, go across go across the board. The places where people are making abortion illegal have one thing in common. Republican Party is in control. And joining us now is, uh, oh, I guess no one's joining us now. I'm sorry. And he married almost all of them. Ick. But it didn't stop there. He had dozens of his own wives, too. Some say as many as 80. Even more shocking were the ages of some of those wives. Several of them were in their mid-teens, and a couple of them were just 12 years old. And before Jeffs was arrested and charged and convicted of sexually assaulting a child, his marriages produced dozens and dozens of children. This extended family was the cult's inner circle. These wives and children had an up-close and very personal look at Warren Jeffs, his epic rise, and his dramatic fall. One of those children is Wendell Jeffson, a boy who grew up with more than 50 siblings. What was it like growing up in a church where your own father was considered by some a prophet and God's representative on earth, but by others a mere criminal and a pedophile? Wendell Jeffson will be with me right after the break. You won't want to miss this. Um, this is not something that you rush headlong into. This is not something that you promote as safe and effective. The science is absolutely not there, not by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and here in, uh, in the U.S., there are two organizations, the American College of Pediatricians, which is, has clearly um, presented science that refutes what uh, what the Biden administration is putting forth. And okay, so the they're not society, listening to the science. They're not listening to the science. No, they're not. They're not. Okay. And the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine has refuted the Biden administration's document practically line by line. Okay, um, so this, is SC, this is devastating. Org. This is devastating. Mm -hmm. We will make sure to get that information on my website. Um, we'll have you on the podcast, too, to go to, we'll have more time to talk about all these issues. But, Doctor, you gave us some amazing perspective tonight. Thank you. 
Bring your friends appetite and thirst to the original South Dakota barbecue champ. For home. It's all happening Wheel Jam Weekend. Take a break from the action and savor the best barbecue in the state. Vote for your favorites at the Fat Friday Chili Challenge and Backyard Barbecue People's Choice Contest. Visit WheelJam.com for a complete list of events, and we'll see you at the original South Dakota Barbecue Championship. To understand what's actually going on in the home because they are not trained. Okay, so what's the solution to that? Are you, you you're suggesting some sort of state certification before they can do that? Some sort of... Like I said, you know, she, she talked to big. This happens, if it does happen, a constitutional right that women have had for 50 years will be gone. It's a monumental moment in mm -hmm. this country's politics. What's your reaction? It, it's a category five uh, political and social hurricane uh, in this country. As you point out, in one fell swoop, uh, something that was a right for women for the last 50 years has been taken away. We do not know the, all the ramifications of this uh, yet at this point. But I want to point out that this is something the Republican Party has worked on for decades, assiduously at the state level, at the uh, federal level, uh, in the judiciary, trying to get to this moment. And it is something, as I think one of my colleagues pointed out earlier, that Democrats, while they've talked about it a lot, have effectively said, uh, you know, we're, they, 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 didn't, they didn't do it in the way Republicans did. They didn't protect it in the way Republicans fought it. And in the end now, you have this conservative majority on the court, and the Democrats are going to face a midterm election very soon, and then a presidential election, and they're going to have to decide how they battle this out, how they use this uh, in order to get those voters out there to the polls to understand that elections have consequences. And this, for those pro-choice Democrats, was one of the consequences they hoped would never happen but it looks like it's happening. You know, we, uh, what Gloria said, David, we say it so much that the, there's no clear example, though, of just how much our elections do have consequences, real consequences in this country right. than what we are seeing right now, David. Well, we haven't seen anything like this in our lifetime. Uh, the, the, the wholesale withdrawal of a basic right. Uh, and so, you know, I, there's, it's, it's really hard to think of a precedent for this. But I will say, if you were a Republican strategist, privately or right now, you would say, this is not good. We do not need this. We were on the path to winning a big victory in the fall. The wholesale overturning of Roe versus Wade may be the one thing that could change uh, the dynamic. Uh, because the people who have in polling expressed the strongest objection, and remember, uh, the vast majority of Americans, 70 percent of Americans or more, have said they did not want this. But the people who were most vociferous about this uh, were uh, people under 45, uh, Democrats, obviously, women. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, and, and, and these were the voters who uh, Democrats were particularly worried about in the fall. Will they come out? Will they participate? There's been polling suggesting that the enthusiasm wasn't there. Uh, this could galvanize those voters, Don. You look at, at uh, CNN's own polling, and younger voters, uh, a majority of younger voters said they'd be angry if the court uh, did this. So um, I think it had, you know, there are, the, the most important thing is there are real implications for real lives across this country. But as a political matter, uh, it also is a, pr uh, a very significant event. Mm -hmm. Gloria, let's talk about that. He brings up a point. You know, uh, CNN's polling from January. Mm -hmm. I'll let you weigh in. It shows 69 percent. He said 70 percent. It's close enough. 69 percent of Americans do not support mm -hmm. overturning Roe v. Wade. Uh, just 30 percent support overturning it. So what do you think? Does that... Does that have, uh, does that fuel the Republican Party with so many, this has fueled the Republican Party for so many years, but do you think that this somehow pushes the enthusiasm among Democrats that they may come out, especially women, those under 45, um, as David said? Well, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do. I don't know how much. I mean, they couldn't get, 
you know, any less enthusiastic about uh, going to the polls right now. I mean, you look at the enthusiasm gap between Democrats and Republicans. Democrats are much less enthusiastic about voting. Joe Biden is an unpopular president. We've got an economy that's pretty rough. This is something that, uh, that, uh, that voters understand, that women voters understand. And I think when you take away something that people have had, yeah. that's difficult. That's really difficult. And you already have 18 states that have enacted pretty restrictive laws. So you see it going on around the country. Mm -hmm. It's there. This could affect battleground states like Arizona, like Georgia. So um, I'm not surprised. Our colleague Jeff Zeleny said the president's going to come out and talk about this tomorrow. He's not going to wait for the official opinion. So this clearly, they believe, is a way to motivate Democrats and say, look at what is happening. This is not something you want, and this is going to affect voters at the bottom end of the economic scale. Those are the people the Democrats say they want to help. Um, so they're going to use it. Now, it may be an uphill battle for them. We all understand that. But of course, uh, this is an issue that now has a lot more resonance than it did 10 hours ago. David, let me ask you, I mean, is it, should the president yeah, well, let, do let, that? Let just, should the president do that? Is it premature for him to come out? I mean, this is just a draft. Again, it's political reporting. CNN has not confirmed that. But is it, is it premature for the president to do that? It seems like the battle is engaged here, Don. I, I, I'm, you know, you're right. The prudent thing, I guess, would be to wait six weeks. But um, we're having this discussion now, and people all over the country are going to be having uh, this discussion. And there are plenty of indications, uh, based on what the court has already done, uh, that uh, this is very consistent uh, with the signals that have been sent. So uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily inappropriate for him to come out and make a forceful a statement about this. I want to make a, a different point uh, uh, based, sure, uh, you know, adding to what, uh, yes, there are state elections all over this country. If this goes down as it is written, then all of a sudden state legislatures and governors are going to be the mm -hmm. people who are going to make these decisions. And there are very, very hotly contested governor's races in many of the battleground states uh, that are going to have big Senate races this fall. Uh, and you could see the outcome of those races shifting uh, as a result of this, as people focus on putting governors in office who will protect abortion rights uh, for, their, uh, for their citizens. David, Gloria, thank you both. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Sure. Get down. A leaked Supreme Court draft opinion. Uh, calls that they had been receiving of sexual abuse, but we didn't know that. They come in uh, as a seven-year-old kid. I see people with guns, and it just kind of confirmed everything that we had been taught growing up, that they were there to hurt us or to... 20,000 people showed up at the March for Life every year, even in freezing right. uh, weather, horrible weather, great weather. And this was a young person's movement, too, yeah. which I think it's a religious movement, right. but a young person's movement. And That's I, what's unusual. And I've been talking to a number of people in law enforcement who said those law clerks should be lined up tomorrow by the chief justice. They should be interrogated by the FBI and him. And if someone doesn't Says hand no. over and say, I did it, they should all be laid off and find new clerks. Maybe well, that's I think a you might idea. have to. Yeah, I don't know how else you, you purge the ranks of a leaker in the middle of this, uh, in the middle of the Supreme Court yeah. and the destabilization of one of our precious institutions. Well, former Texas Democratic gubernatorial candidate, remember her, Wendy Pink Sneakers uh, Davis? Didn't she have pink sneakers? Mm -hmm. She had this to say. What will the ripple impacts of this be? Not only in the lives of the individuals who will be impacted, but in our economy across this country as women's ability to participate in the workforce takes a dramatic and drastic blow. And that's exactly what's going to happen with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Mm. Raymond, your response. Well, this is not about economies, and that's not where the Supreme Court justices come from. They're looking at this as a constitutional matter. Does the Constitution of the United States prohibit states? Pro uh, does it allow abortion on demand, state to state, as a as a national fiat? The answer is, if you read this opinion, no, it does not. 
There is no well, right to abortion in the Constitution under this majority d opinion. And they say very clearly when you find read it, in, it. Yeah, find it in the 14th Amendment. It was legal fiction it was privacy. from day one. There's a right to privacy there. Well, that came from the contraception case, and it trickled on down. And they, and they read abortion into it. But there, it, this was always this shaky. This was a law. state issue. And, and we and have Ruth to say. And Ginsburg said it was shaky and bad. Well, and I, I, everyone has to remember tonight, like before everybody freaks out, that this is now going to be determined by you, the people. Yeah. Like you can move to, you could live in New York, and you say, look, remember New York did that standing ovation in Albany? No. You want to know what sick is? It's not safe, legal, and rare anymore. In New York, you get a standing ovation for having abortion up until basically the baby, you know, is out of the womb. Mm -hmm. They were they stood and give the standing ovation for the most liberal abortion law I believe in the United States is in New York. They gave it a standing ovation. Okay, that's what the people in New York want. M people in Mississippi, they want something different. That's how our framers understood our country. It wasn't one size fits all. No. So that's how it's going to work. Um, tonight on MSNBC, Jamie Raskin parroted the Democrats' favorite line on this issue. I found it uh, astonishing and appalling. Um, you know, the, the, the basic... Uh, legal claim here is that the word abortion doesn't appear in the Constitution, and of course uh, it doesn't. This would appear to be an invitation to have, uh, you know, a Handmaid's Tale type um, anti-feminist uh, uh, regulation and legislation all over the country. Oh my gosh. Is he not speaking as a former embryo? That's my question <laughs> well, here's tonight. here's my question. When in doubt, when you have no constitutional law to stand upon, cite yeah. Margaret Atwood. I mean, that, I guess that's the, the handmade stuff. I mean, they tale. tried that but, with Kavanaugh, dressing up in the red Right, uh, they were all out with the, in the outfits, marching around. Look, this is performative theater, and I have to say, the leak is part of that. What you're seeing on the streets tonight, this is performative theater. Step back, everybody has to take a big breath. Let the court finally issue its formal opinion, then we as a country can digest it. I don't like that this leaked out. This is a bad day for oh, true. They talk horrific. about democracy, damaging democracy. This is one of the most damaging moments to our democracy right here when a major institution has been breached and undermined. I hope there's a congressional well, investigation oh, right. into this. Oh, I mean, no, no. They're too busy. You know, we're, oh, no, this is my question. Yeah. We're Open. Fields open. Who doesn't love open? Oh, yeah, I hear you. But just looking around, like, that's a lot of smiles, so. Steel plant before the rescue operation was halted by Russian shelling today. 100 adults, 20 children are still believed to be trapped inside of that facility. And there's also a manhunt happening in Alabama. A search underway for a corrections officer and an inmate who disappeared from a county jail on Friday. But I want to go straight away to CNN's Joan Biskupek, CNN legal analyst and Supreme Court biographer and senior political analyst John Ablon. Good evening to both of you. Joan, we're going to start with you for the reporting. We've got some news about the Chief Justice John Roberts and his apparent dissent from Justice Alito's draft opinion. Tell us about it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Don. First of all, just to mention how stunning it is that Politico would publish this draft opinion, which we have not authenticated, but it, it jibes with what we know about what's been going on behind the scenes, uh, at least in a preliminary way. And what we know independently from our own sources is that Chief Justice John Roberts would, would be dissenting from this opinion. He was not prepared to overturn Roe v. Wade, to roll back a half century of precedent. Uh, he's, he's never been in favor of abortion rights generally, but it's just so staggering to remove the right to abortion and for many institutional and other reasons the chief was not planning to join this opinion as far as we know he was however don ready to uphold the mississippi law that was in dispute before the justices mm -hmm. which is a 15-week ban on abortion uh, a ban on abortion at 15 weeks of pregnancy so what what politico has gotten its hands on and published and just you know, a, a real earthquake of news in uh, women's rights and court court protocol. I mean, I'm sure the court right now, the nine justices are just so shaken by having this information out here in this draft form uh, before everything is completely resolved, is that this court is ready to roll back rights by a narrow five to four vote 
uh, which would be stunning nationwide because what Roe v. Wade said in 1973 is that women have a constitutional right to end a pregnancy before about 23 weeks. Mm -hmm. And then just to get to what you asked again about the chief, you know, the chief justice likely was going to separate himself from this opinion for institutional reasons. And just think, Don, how he must feel right now about the institution and integrity of the Supreme Court to have news of what's coming, likely by the end of June, to be to burst on the scene like this and so disturb so many women, so many people on both sides of this debate to see this haphazard uh, uh, announcement of sorts or release of sorts of an information that's going to affect so many so many lives the political scene across America consider whether to declare copies of five different books surplus at their meeting tomorrow these 350 copies are designated to quote be destroyed but it appears that the process may be on hold at least for now fellow lands Dan Santella explains on the night B good evening Dan Good evening, Dan. The, the school board agenda says the district regularly discards items it sees as unnecessary or not suitable. The surplus property list also includes printers and chairs, but the copies of the five books are the only items listed as to be destroyed. One of the books is titled Fun Home, a Family Tragic Comic. According to the Banned Books Project, it features a lesbian character whose father is gay. Another book is The Perks of Being a Wallflower, the American Library Association lists homosexuality and sexual content as reasons for challenges against it. Another book on the list is Girl, Woman, Other. According to the New York Times, it has a main character who is a lesbian. A book titled How Beautiful We Were is also on the district's list. The author's website says this book discusses environmental decline because of an oil company. The final book is The Circle. I reached out to Superintendent Lori Simon and most of the members of the school board about the books. Board member Amy Pollocky says, quote, books are commonly listed as surplus this time of year as lesson plans are changed and new books are considered. She also says the agenda item dealing with surplus is likely to be placed on what she calls a future agenda. Board President Kate Thomas emailed me that administrators as well as the director of teaching, learning and innovation came to an agreement on destroying the books following an investigation. I will include links to all the resources I just cited on Kelloland.com. And this is a story that I'll continue to follow, too. All right. Thanks a lot, Dan. Police in Guatemala have arrested two Mexican nationals wanted for... ...updating its current facilities, but it will also be adding new programs. We're going to be adding men's and women's soccer, men's and women's golf. Uh, we're going to add a new eSport of drone racing. He says the new opportunities and facilities... No draft decision in modern history of the court has been disclosed publicly while a case was still pending. This is creating shockwaves here in D.C. about how this leak. SCOTUS blog, one of the experts who write about the highest court, tweeting, quote, it's impossible to overstate the earthquake this will cause inside the court in terms of the destruction of trust among the justices and staff. This leak is the gravest, most unforgivable sin. Now, this is just the draft decision. The Supreme Court could change the votes. Uh, the court's holding will not be final until it is published, likely in the next two months. So this leak could change that. Some calling for the decision now or criticism the leak was done to change the opinion or cause an uprising or a reaction like you're seeing here tonight, Leland and Marnie. Kelly, are you, I know you're in touch with folks at the White House. Are you hearing anything from your sources right now? Is the White House responding at all to this? We are checking in with sources at the White House to see what their response is. We are seeing uh, increasing calls. There's actually some Democratic candidates here um, for Senate uh, out here uh, tonight. Some of them already calling um, to get rid of the filibuster and protect these rights. Um, but as far as what the White House is saying tonight, we're still waiting to see any official word or official tweet from them here. All right, Kelly, stay put. Um, that obviously is a situation we're going to be following closely. and. Um, 
I'll just request that we kind of keep that shot up and we'll keep dipping back in as the crowds continue to grow. Kelly Meyer live outside the Supreme Court tonight. Kelly, thank you. We welcome in May Davis, former legal advisor to President Trump now and also former aide to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and host of the Aggressive Progressive mm -hmm. podcast. Chris Hahn, uh, to both of you, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, May, I suppose let's start with you. Um, I mean, there's one, you've got the question of if this is true, the ramifications it would have, and two, the fact that this leak happened to begin with is unprecedented, um, leaving many tonight speechless. First, your reaction. I mean, the leak really is the story right now. Of course, I mean, that overshadows how monumental this decision is, uh, if it is a majority decision. But the Supreme Court will have to change the way it operates. Right now, it's a very open institution. I worked in the White House. We really tried to, to rein in leaks. We closed our circulation. We marked our pieces of paper. It was, we really tried hard to be secretive. The Supreme Court does not do that. They send every opinion to every justice, to every clerk. You're able to print whatever you want. This is a huge, as SCOTUS blog said, a huge breach of trust. It's, it will change the way the Supreme Court operates. It will change the trust in the building. Uh I want to get to the political implications. May, stand by one second, because I know um, you and I talked about this when the case uh, got to the Supreme Court about Roe. Chris Hahn, to you real quick. Um, all of a sudden now, this discussion among Democrats, sitting U.S. senators saying, throw out the filibuster uh, in the Senate and try to push through a federal legalization uh, of abortion. Uh, a, is that even reasonable to think that would happen in the next a few months before the election. B, what are you hearing uh, in terms of how this changes the dynamics uh, for November? Well, if I was still advising my former boss, Chuck Schumer, I would tell him to throw out the filibuster tomorrow and codify Roe in the United States Senate and ask Susan Collins, who was so sure that Brett Kavanaugh wouldn't vote to yeah. overturn Roe that she voted for him to join in that overthrowing of the filibuster for this purpose, and maybe this purpose alone. So yeah, I think it's very important. As for the electoral consequences, you and I have talked about this before. I think this changes the dynamic in the election. I don't know that it saves the House for the Democrats because gerrymandering is a hell of a drug, but I think it makes the Senate much more winnable for Democrats oh, yeah. in November, and it makes the, the House a much closer majority for Republicans should they gain the majority in the House, which gives Kevin McCarthy lots of problems. He should be staying up late now after the week he had last week, seeing this, this uh, ruling be leaked today, which will ultimately come out in June. Uh, you know, look, it's going to be a very small majority. He's going to have to keep his caucus together, and I don't think he can do that. Hey, May, uh, I, I have to think, but as soon as this story broke, uh, Politico dropped it. Uh, at about 8.30 at night, uh, 7.30 uh, local time here in Chicago. My first thought went to uh, Leonard Leo, um, the head of the Federal Society, um, which is the conservative legal group that is focused now for the past 30 years on getting uh, conservative justices uh, appointed to the Supreme Court uh, and started all the way with identifying young conservatives in law schools around the country. When the court first heard the challenges to the Mississippi law and others that, that will result in this decision of a, a possible overturn of Roe v. Wade. Uh, you said uh, that if the court does not overturn Roe v. Wade, it sort of, it, it ends this idea of conservative legal activism. Is, if this is true, uh, is this proof that long-term strategic planning in American politics is not dead? And I think you'd have to, uh, everyone would have to point back and look at Leonard Leo as the grand chess master, if you will. Well, yes. So I think that, you know, the Federalist Society definitely does promote that the role of a justice is to be a justice, to say what the law is, and not to be a senator, not to create laws for especially the entire United States, uh, you know, as as a majority of five. So I think that that idea that there is the rule of law and that that law is set by either Congress or the states is something that the Federal Society has been railing on for a very long time and that this affirms that. That yeah. said, 
you know, the Federal Society does not say we are pro-life, we are pro-choice, and this decision does not say it is pro-life, it is pro-choice. This just says that you states can decide. So in, in fact, this could end up being, it's not going to be, but it could be the most pro-choice decision ever if every state decided to go, you know, in one direction. So really, I think that this just gets the states in uh, the driver's seat as to what sort of policies are going to affect people who live there. Uh, let's get to um, some of the reaction to this draft leak tonight. Um, first, from Planned Parenthood uh, on the potential overturning of Roe v. Wade. They say, while abortion is still legal, tonight's report makes clear that our deepest fears are coming true. We have reached a crisis moment for abortion access. We don't have a moment to spare. We must act now. March for Life also tweeting out tonight, we will not be providing a comment on an official decision of SCOTUS's possible leak until a decision is officially announced. We also believe given the leak, the court should issue a ruling as soon as possible. This leak was meant to corrupt the process. It's heartbreaking. Some abortion advocates will stoop to any level to intimidate the court, no matter the consequences. All right, um, Chris, I hear you chuckling. Um, motivation of this leak. You know, it's hard to speculate the motivation of this leak. Remember, there are probably people on both sides that don't want to see stare decisis being destroyed. This decision is going to destroy the Supreme Court ultimately here. Their legitimacy as a body, as they stated in the Casey decision years ago, overturning this precedent, which so many people in this country have relied upon, uh, is going to be damaging to the court. It will also damage other rights. Remember. Uh, Roe finds a right to privacy in the Constitution. Chris, Chris, you know Roe what, you know also Chris, informed things Chris, like Griswold Chris, and others. What, you know I love you, but come on. How do you write this script that this is a conservative leak? It, it ha there is no way that this didn't come from someone who either was from the liberal camp or a liberal-leaning clerk or a liberal-leaning justice. Those are the only people who have access to this, who wanted to in some way to inflame the the waters in the political conversation uh, ahead of this and try to potentially change a vote or potentially water down the opinion. I can't. I, you you, come on, you I, gotta make a huge I stretch. Wanna, you gotta make a huge well, stretch look, to say I this was from some conservative I, who wanted to keep stare decisis. Really? You know, I clerked. I clerked in the federal courts. I never clerked as high up as in the Supreme Court, but I do recall it being a place where people had a lot of honor. I find it hard to believe that one of the justices leaked this. I find it hard to believe that one of their clerks leaked this. God knows how this got out, but it did get out. And now that it's out, the court's got to do something about it, whether or not they act sooner rather than later on this, rather than waiting till the end of June to release this opinion. But they're going to have to deal with it. And the court has really no experience in dealing with issues like, again, this is the first time I think it's ever happened in the modern era where a draft opinion has been leaked. First so time. I don't know how they deal with it. They're going to need a crisis manager to help them because uh, I'm sure they don't have the skill set on staff to deal with this issue right now. May, let's bring you in here because, um, I mean, he's talking about the legitimate. She is a doctor, but she's not removing my gallbladder. Unless well, she's she wants not going to show up to work anyways because. We have never done anything like that in the history of this country. And this may pretend to put this off on the states to make their own decisions, but we've already seen Missouri enact or propose a law that would make it a crime to leave the state or deny individuals the opportunity to leave the state to seek abortion care elsewhere. And this is something that happened in the days when interracial marriage was prohibited. It could be a crime to actually leave the state to transact an interracial marriage. So we are actually going to see not a state-by-state state -state settlement of this, but actually more interjurisdictional conflict over abortion and the withdrawal of a right that many Americans have come to take for granted at this point. Phil, Phil, could this big win for Republicans end up being be careful what you wish for? Year after year, they incessantly campaign on this because it brings out evangelical single issue voters. But when you add in the majority of Republicans and swing voters, undecided voters, the overwhelming majority of this country do not want a ban on abortion. Could this end up blowing up in Republicans' face? 
It, it could potentially, Stephanie, and here's something to think about. Uh, it's not just this Supreme Court decision, but anti-abortion activists are planning, uh, and my colleague at The Washington Post, Caroline uh, Kitchener, has a great piece on this out this morning, are planning uh, to move even further, to try to advocate for a federal ban uh, on all abortions uh, after six weeks by the Congress. And so if Republicans uh, were to win majorities in the House and the Senate, their leadership would come under extraordinary pressure from activists in their own party to push forward that kind of legislation. But that is the kind of legislation that, as you note, is unpopular with the broader uh, American public. And it could uh, serve the purpose of really cutting into Republican support politically. And you should look to see Democrats try to take advantage uh, of this court ruling, if in fact this is how the court is going to end up ruling on abortion, to warn that Republicans could take away other rights as well. There's language in this draft opinion that alludes to gay rights, and that alludes uh, to same-sex marriage uh, and other social uh, values and rights that are very near and dear to Democrats and to the progressive base. And I think they can use this court ruling, or at least will try to use this court ruling, as a way to galvanize their own voters ahead of the midterm elections. Melissa, I want to share a clip from Brett, Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing, of course, that hearing under oath. Here's what he said. Have your views on whether Roe is settled precedent or could be overturned? And, and has your views changed since you were in the Bush White House? Senator, I um, said that it's settled as a precedent of the Supreme Court entitled to respect under principles of stare decisis. And one of the important things to keep in mind about Roe v. Wade is that it has been reaffirmed many times over the past uh, 45 years, as you know. And uh, most prominently, most importantly, reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992. And as you well recall, Senator, I know uh, when that case came up, the Supreme Court didn't just reaffirm it uh, in passing, the court specifically went through all the factors of stare decisis in considering whether to overrule it. And the joint opinion of Justice Kennedy, Justice O'Connor, and Justice Souter at great length went through that, those factors. That was the question presented in the case. So, Melissa, let's say I'm Dianne Feinstein. After getting an answer like that, I would think, yep, he's not going to touch Roe versus Wade. And now here we are. Does this now show that whatever these justices say in their confirmation hearings just gets thrown out the window once they're on the bench? Well, I testified against Brett Kavanaugh in that confirmation hearing. And so, you know, I may be biased on this, but I said then, and I'll say it now, that I thought he would be a likely vote to overturn Roe versus Wade, no matter what he said. But if you listen closely, he talked about Planned Parenthood versus Casey and the fact that Casey articulates a number of factors that the court has to consider before it can overrule a past precedent. If you go through this draft opinion, if it's true, and this is the draft of the majority, they go through all of those Casey factors. They simply come out with the view that Roe versus Wade was egregiously wrong and was wrong on the day that it was decided back in 1973. And Brett Kavanaugh promised no more than that, um, simply going through those factors. And, and here we are. And so I think he's kept his end of the bargain and perhaps we may need to interrogate what our part of the bargain was. Here we are. That is exactly right. Phil Rucker, Barbara McQuaid, Ari Melber, Melissa Murray, thank you all for starting us off on this very important night. Coming up next, much more on this breaking news. The political earthquake it is about to set off. And practically speaking, the future of abortion in this country, what it means for women. The CEO of Planned Parenthood joins us next. The 11th hour just getting underway. <laughs> Who dressed him? The way they casually talk about controlling communication and deciding what you get to say is more revealing than... And far from bringing about a national settlement of the abortion issue, Roe and Casey have inflamed debate and deepened mm -hmm. division. Uh, we are seeing tonight the reaction of the what if 
outside the Supreme Court, and you're going to start to see that in the hours and days to come until somebody comes out and says exactly what is happening. You're looking at the live pictures outside the Supreme Court tonight. This is just a couple of hours after Politico released this draft opinion from the Supreme Court that they say was circulating inside the court, uh, obtained by Politico. SCOTUS has voted, they say, to strike down the landmark decision, unprecedented Roe v. Wade, a 49-year case uh, tonight. This is major breaking news. We're going to have more for you right after this. If you are moderate to severe Crohn's disease, their families and, and we do other uh, apartments. Immunotherapy drug Keytruda might benefit her based on the specific genetic makeup of her tumor. And that testing proved to be right. It doesn't always work, but for me, you know, I'm two and a half years later in a quality of life that's amazing and I would have never gotten to have. She is back to doing the things she loves. So I do Pilates probably about four times a week. There's some rowing in there, and now that it'll warm up, we do bike rides that are about 20 miles um, every weekend. Um, I'm walking. And only has to go in every three weeks for an IV treatment. Most nights I could go exercise afterwards. I have no downtime. Um, it's pretty amazing. Joanne's doctors say her scans show no signs of active cancer. Now Joanne is taking each day as it comes and is grateful for this emerging field of medicine. And the message is, you know, take each new day as a gift. Because I'm a perfect example. You would have bet money I would have never been one diagnosed with anything, much less cancer. I know. That's what I heard. So I told Michelle, I said, you know. For more information, just head over to avera.org slash medical minute. Well, coming up next in sports, he traveled thousands of miles to pitch for the Dort Defenders. Mark Ovenden with our Athlete of the Week. That's next in Dakota News Now Sports. Daily Harvest takes care of food so that food can... Among his students is current senior John Costello. He's friendly and he's approachable. So if you want to express an opinion, um, you're free to do that. And he supports that as long as you have evidence. He motivates you because you don't want to disappoint him as opposed to... You know, some teachers get you scared. I don't want this teacher mad at me. Whereas with him, he gets you motivated, and your motivation is, I don't want to disappoint this teacher, which is unique, and it's, it's a goal that we strive for as teachers. The 66-year-old Gordon graduated high school in 1973 and has a degree from Dakota State University, where physical education and history were his majors. History is defined by its people and events, and different people have dramatically different viewpoints and passions about them. So how does a history teacher navigate all this? At times it's uh, challenging, and I think it's a good representation of uh, America as a democracy when, when you think about teaching and you have to understand that uh, everybody's background uh, isn't the same. Nor is everyone's perspective. I try to be fair to the material and I try to make comments uh, such as, well, if you were this person in this situation, you might look at it this way. And if you were this person in this situation, you might look at it this way. Gordon has taught Lindemann. What I learned from him is that you put your students first. Some students require more work than others, and that's part of the job. Put the students first, and always look out for the best interest of the student. What do they say about, uh, about effective history teachers? If, uh, if they can leave the room and not know your political affiliation, you must be doing all right. Do you think you've accomplished that? I'm not sure. I, I, I know that I've tried to. Like Lindemann, Mahoney has been Gordon's colleague for more than three decades. I guess I could tell you I don't even know his personal political beliefs after all these years. He's just um, a person who has a wealth of knowledge about history, and he wants to share that knowledge, and he really doesn't want to paint it in one direction or the other. Now, Gordon's direction is that of riding off into the sunset of retirement. A lot of history has happened since 1977. I've always considered this a, a career and a calling, and... It's, it's just been a wonderful place for me to be. With Eye on Kelloland, I'm Dan Centella.
We appreciate what he does. 45 years. Yeah. Wow. Gordon, Mahoney, and Lindemann all taught Dan when he attended O'Gorman High School. Well, rivals Augustana and USF wrapped up their three-game series in baseball, plus the NSIC softball regular season concluded today. We have highlights next in sports. Because I believe in democracy and the judicial branch. So I have fought for abortion to be legal, safe, and rare. The majority of the country believes that abortion should be legal, but with restrictions. So the far left wants no restrictions, the far right wants no abortions. The majority of the country believes that abortion should be legal, safe, and rare. If you are the majority of the country, your rights were just overturned, perhaps, um, as indicated by this brief. That's gonna be very unpopular. And lastly, just to get to the politics, I think very good news for Democrats who were looking at a bloodbath in November and now might have a fighting chance because uh, this ruling might give them everything they need to get turnout where they need it to be. You believe that? Uh, you know, David Axelrod was on earlier uh, making that point. I think Gloria weighed in and, and agreed as well. You believe that this could actually uh, galvanize Democrats? Uh, and, and actually help well, them come midterms? Like all of the Republican, draconian abortion laws in various states that essentially banned abortion, which weren't even popular in some of those states, um, I think that took a big issue off the table for Republicans. So they can't really run on those successes because they've quote unquote won them. And for Democrats, I mean, to have the Supreme Court indicate they might overturn Roe v. Wade is the biggest galvanizer of votes that I can imagine that I couldn't literally three hours ago, um, turning a lot of voters out to the polls. So I think this, I don't, I don't want to be crass about it because this is actually devastating, but, uh, you know, for politics, this is good news for Democrats. Kirsten? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the most important thing right now, separate from the politics, is just to acknowledge how shocking this is and how extremist it is. This is really extreme behavior from the Supreme Court, if this is accurate. Um, I don't know how their reputation survives this, frankly. Uh, it's wildly out of the mainstream. Most Americans, as Essie was just saying, uh, su support Roe v. Wade. They do not want it overturned. Uh, even many pro-life Americans feel that way, as Essie just articulated. So what they're doing is extremely radical. It's not just about abortion, it's about equality. And I think that that's something that a lot of people don't understand about the fight for reproductive rights is that it is about is fundamentally a question about whether or not women in this country are full human beings who have control over their bodies and their abilities to make their own decisions about their reproductive choices regardless of what other people think about them it is fine to be pro-life be pro-life don't have an abortion it is not fine to say that women are not full human beings, people, they're so obsessed with how a fetus or a, an embryo is a person. Well, guess what? Women are people. And women are people that have the full rights in this country. And that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just some culture war issue, which we want to turn it into. It is about women's fundamental rights. Um, I want, let's put this up, Ron, and, and have you weigh in uh, to both um, Essie and Kirsten's point. Roughly 70% of Americans, this is a CNN poll, yeah. found the, roughly seven, CNN poll found that 70% of Americans do not want Roe overturned. Democrats tonight hoping that this is going to push people to the polls this fall. But Republicans have been promising to do this for decades, right? If it didn't motivate pro-choice voters before, why will it now? Well, a couple, couple of thoughts, Don. First of all, you know, when SC was kind of quoting the 
Bill Clinton, famous Bill Clinton mantra that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. I think the most powerful word of those three is legal. As you point out, over two thirds of the country believes Roe should not be overturned. Uh, and when you look at the, spe the specifics of the kinds of bans that are being passed in red states, as I wrote recently, of the dozen abortion restrictions that have been approved in this legislative session in 2021 and 2022 in red states, nine of them have no exception for rape and incest. Uh, and that is a proposition that probably has support from about 15% of the country banning abortion, even in cases of rape and incest. And what Republicans have been betting uh, is that this is what, like what the NRA always said about gun issues. The only people who cared about it were the people who opposed gun control. Uh, and for many years, uh, that seemed to be the case, certainly on abortion, uh, because Roe, as, as he was talking about, has been the law of the land uh, for two generations. And the thought that it could be removed really was abstract and immaterial to most voters. Well, now this is very different. This concentrates the mind. And it's not clear to me that this will completely erase the turnout enthusiasm gap that the party in the White House always faces in a midterm. But I agree, there is nothing uh, that could have the effect more powerfully than this. I mean, the K they, uh, Alito in his, in his, in his uh, draft opinion, according to uh, Politico, as I've read the decision or the decision, uh, draft decision, compares this to Plessy. The real comparison is Dred Scott in 1857, right. where you have a Supreme Court uh, appointed by an earlier political majority trying to up block the agenda of a new emerging uh, social majority. 77% of people under 35 opposed overturning Roe in that CNN poll. And that is the generations that the Supreme Court has put itself on a collision course with. I, that, that fascinating conversation. I loved having this conversation. Nessie and I loved hearing from you, especially someone who is pro-life and who's also conservative. Uh, it's a good point of view uh, to have. Thank you both. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Thank we'll be you. right back. No choice. No choice. If you've been looking for real news, you've had no choice until now. News Nation is new. We're different. We're not taking sides or leaning into political agendas. If you're looking for the news without the noise, you have the freedom to choose. Come back to something different. Come back to balance. Come back to fearless reporting. Come back to the news. News Nation. News for all America. Digital Technologies has your technology. Can't wait and it seems every day is different. Free evacuations are underway from the besieged city of Mariupol. Dozens of civilians who were holed up in and around the Azovstal steel plant. The last pocket of resistance. Well, they have now emerged, though hundreds more remain, and they are running out of food, water and medicine. A larger evacuation of the general population is also ongoing, but it is slow moving. Mariupol's mayor says the Russian forces are creating obstacles and making progress difficult. Listen now to some of the Ukrainians who have managed to escape. The shelling was so strong and it kept hitting near us. At the exit of the bomb shelter, on the top few steps, one could breathe as there was not enough oxygen. I was afraid to even walk out and breathe some fresh air. I was afraid to stick my nose out, so to say. I can't believe it. Two months of darkness. When we were in the bus, I told my husband, Vasya, we won't have to go to the toilet with a flashlight and not use a bag, a bin with a flashlight. We did not see any sunlight. We were scared. We lived in the basement starting from the 27th of February. We didn't leave because our house is in close proximity to Azovstal. The whole time we were shelled with mines and then airstrikes started. Our house is completely destroyed. We have a two-storey building. It's not there anymore. It burned to the ground. The scariest part is when they are shelling. When you see a shell exploding and people dying, this is the scariest part. Writer Peter Pomerantsev is an expert on Russian propaganda who just recently spoke with the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky. And, and welcome to the program, Peter, coming to us from Vilnius in Lithuania. And firstly, that interview with Mr Zelensky, what was your read of his mindset and his view of where this war might be headed? 
Well, um, the interview was conducted by myself and my colleagues at The Atlantic, uh, Jeff Goldberg and, and, and Applebaum. Uh, I mean, I think the great worry for Zelensky is, is really about making sure no one relaxes. Yes, Ukraine has made amazing gains in retaking the areas around Kiev, but the big, big, scary battle is just starting in the east. And, and his main concern was that, you know, that, that nobody had some sort of sense of false victory. Mm. You, you, you've also been touring the country talking to Ukrainians about how they feel about the war, engaging opinion uh, towards Russia. You wrote a, an amazing piece in The Atlantic about the horrors that one particular family faced and described their experiences, I think, as a microcosm of the war's propaganda front. Briefly explain that to us. Sure. I mean, I, I have to say that the story was was first discovered by my colleague, uh, Andriy Bashtevi, a Ukrainian journalist, and he brought me to Lukashivka, which is a village um, near Chernigov in the north of uh, Ukraine that had been held uh, for several weeks by, by the Russian army. And uh, there was one story there that, that really struck both of us about a family, the Horbanosas, who um, uh, essentially spent three weeks in their cellar living with, with Russian soldiers. They, they were all hiding from the kind of artillery exchanges above them themselves and I've got to say these Russian soldiers were not were not sadistic in in, in any way they, they, they allowed well they took over the Hobonosa's cellar but then they allowed the Hobonosa's to live with them and over several weeks they kind of developed a, a, a sort of relationship and the Hobonosa's started questioning them like you know what are you doing here what is this war for and and the answers that the soldiers gave and I suppose their changes over time were uh, uh, indicative of, of many things in, in Russian society. Uh, only one of the soldiers was like a true believer in the cause, a real believer this was a war against Nazis or against NATO. The other soldiers were pretty cynical. You know, they were there because it was their job, because of money, um, because they had mortgages to pay off. And like I suspect, most Russians are actually, you know, very grounded in their in their you know everyday reality. Um, and, and over the three weeks, uh, the Holbanos sort of ground them down. I mean, by the end of soldiers all admitted that this was a, a senseless war. That was the extraordinary thing, that glimpse into how those Russian soldiers felt initially and then how their thoughts uh, changed over time with that family. I, I wanted to ask you, how is the family now and how do they look back on that experience? Well, listen, uh, the family have lost their, their homes. I mean, the, 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 the invasion has meant that their homes, you know, their home and their, their garden and, and all their property has been completely destroyed. It's just complete rubble. Um, so, you know, they're thinking about how they rebuild their lives. Um, but they're also, I think, quite grateful that, that, you know, their village and they themselves did not undergo the kind of atrocities that, you know, thousands of Ukrainians have been subjected to, hundreds of thousands, we just heard about Mariupol, yeah. um, from, from, your, from your reporters. So, so in a weird way, they feel they've been spared the very worst of what could have happened. What an extraordinary experience. Now, now uh, of course, inside... Uh, he's the junior senator from Missouri, obviously somebody who has uh, deep ambitions. Uh, to be put uh, gently. Uh, I will say, if this is the court's opinion, it's a heck of an opinion, voluminously researched, tightly argued, morally powerful. The left starts its echo chamber assaulting the court and its integrity, which was clearly the strategy all along. Shameful. The court should not abide by, should not abide this coordinated assault by the left. Issued the decision now. The timing here um, is pretty wild, and it's kind of interesting to, to just go through the TikTok. Uh, this story broke about three hours ago. Uh, within 30 minutes, the reporter who broke it for Politico shockingly showed up uh, at the top of Rachel Maddow's show on MSNBC. Within a couple of minutes, a couple of key and prominent liberal senators were on air, including Amy Klobuchar, who had uh, an instant reaction saying that she believed that the filibuster should be overturned in the U.S. Senate and that abortion rights must now be codified in federal law uh, ahead of the election uh, in November. Uh, always in Washington, Let's take a step back and watch sort of the maneuvering and how the chess pieces have moved. It appears as though the right was caught very, very off guard by this. And the uh, members of the right that I talked to, uh, both from the legal side and the political side, were shocked. People on the left seemed less so, and certainly the coordinated talking points and the media plan that came from Democrats 
appeared to have a lot more cohesion to it than what we've seen on the right. Well, I think the overarching concern, Leland, is there was a breach of court Huge. practice. Clearly, there was a leak that shouldn't have happened. It has never happened yeah. before. Not in our lifetimes have we seen something like this on such a major and divisive issue. Pro-choice, pro-life, overturning Roe v. Wade. This is important, and people care about this issue more than they care about pretty much anything else. And tonight, there is a lot of speculation as to what the court is going to do and if, in fact, they will overturn. Uh, let's go back out to Kelly Meyer. She is live outside the Supreme Court. Kelly, set the scene for us as we have been looking at these images of people showing up. Um, talk about security, um, what you see happening. Hey guys, well, it's only getting more um, crowded as the night goes on and more heated. Uh, we are seeing both sides uh, stand off really against one another, uh, both shouting back and forth at one another. Uh, here in front of the Supreme Court, the crowd uh, getting bigger. Uh, we are seeing some of a police presence uh, here on the steps behind the barricades. Uh, but I want to bring in, we have Bella here with us, who is, um, who are you representing here? Um, I'm Bella. I'm just a student at GW. I'm an organizer by trade. Um, I primarily a climate organizer, but I'm here to show that these issues are intersectional. Um, we're here for all people who get abortions and all people who menstruate and all people who birth, um, not just for women. Um, and we're here to make that absolutely clear. What do you make of this decision or this uh, initial uh, decision here? Oh, it's disgusting. I'm I'm from Texas, and I can't help but know that like this. This wouldn't have happened if my state didn't take the first step. So I'm disgusted. I'm here out of grief and out of mourning. I was here when the Missouri decision was being made. Um, I was here when the Texas decision was being made. And I'm here to just follow this, follow this journey through, because the journey for abortion rights is a journey for human rights. How many are out here with you tonight? We probably have about 150, if not 200 people, and more people coming. Um, the People's Watch was the coalition around D.C. of activists and organizers are heading over here at uh, midnight. We also have uh, Metro D.C. DSA. We have Sunrise. We have um, college students and the like. Every single person who menstruates and cares about someone who menstruates and can have an abortion is here. So. All right, Kelly Thank Meyer live time. outside the uh, Supreme Court. Bella here Kelly. With, um, like she said, Thank hundreds you. of others representing uh, the, the side that is frustrated over uh, what they're hearing here tonight. We also have people behind us who are supportive of what they're hearing from this initial leaked document. Uh, I don't think Kelly can hear us tonight, but we're going to keep that shot up so you can see what's happening out there. And that is one side of this important and critical issue. And real quickly, as there are two sides, uh, Americans United for Life are saying tonight, we stand alongside all Americans who have waited so hopefully and for so long for the Supreme Court to reverse Roe v. Wade to set America on a path to abortion abolition and to restore justice to our nation. Today is a day for courage and hope. You're going to be hearing from both sides uh, in the hour hours and days to come as we continue to await um, what exactly has happened over the last three hours. The scenes we're seeing at the Supreme Court um, are going to bring up a really important point, <clears throat> which is for the past couple of years, we have heard, uh, especially from the left, the need to protect America's institutions and how important believing in the rule of law and believing in the institutions and the process is. Um, you're now seeing people who, for that amount of time, have, have argued that who are now really unhappy with what the institution has decided and a real lack of respect for the institution in terms of leaking this opinion, how that is handled uh, and if what is good for the goose turns out to be good for the gander uh, over the next few days and weeks is going to be extremely telling. Live pictures outside the Supreme Court. As Kelly noted, uh, things are getting quite raucous. We'll check in back there. Uh, and also uh, bring back in uh, two federal clerks on what this will mean and how quickly whatever opinion comes down will be implemented. It's easy to think that all money managers are pretty much tougher pill to swallow than the counterfeit Viagra Kilmead sells out of his backpack. <laughs> <laughs> it's a matter of racial justice because women who have money and uh, Majority, excuse me, of women who don't have money or low in, who are low income are black and brown women. They don't have the resources to travel to other states like women with money have. And so this is, again, women are going to have abortion, abortions regardless. Uh, what concerns me now is they're not going to be safe if they're going to be illegal. And so uh, I'm, I'm terrified of, of the uh, 
precedent that this is setting also because the next uh, ban they're going to uh, create is a uh, ban on birth control. And so this is a slippery slope, and, and we have to really wake up now and do everything we can do to get uh, the Women's Health Protection Act passed in the Senate. Could you possibly get that done on a bipartisan way now? I mean, not all Republicans support this. There's a whole lot of Republicans tonight, especially those who represent swing districts, swing states, who are not feeling good about this. There are a lot of Republican women out there, Stephanie, who believe that uh, they should have the right to make their own health care decisions. A lot of Republican women, right? So it's up to them. It's up to everyone who believes in, in women's equality, women's reproductive justice, to step up and insist that their senators vote to pass the Women's Health uh, Production uh, Health uh, Care Act. It's just critically important that they step up now and do that because this is not only affecting black and brown women, it's not only affecting women who are registered Democrats, this is affecting all women, Republican women also. And so they need to understand that uh, they're young people and I have uh, three granddaughters. I don't want them to have to deal with <laughs> what we're dealing with now and what I had to deal with in the 60s in terms of having to have an unsafe or illegal abortion and so, yes, Republican women need to let their senators know this impacts them also and that they're going to hold them accountable at the polls. Because in a democracy, that's what this is all about, right? It's holding your elected officials accountable. And so that's what has to happen right, right now. It's going to impact all Americans. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Congresswoman Barbara Lee from the state of California. Coming up, much more on the politics of rolling back the right women have had in this country for nearly half a century when the 11th hour continues. Migraine attacks? And this for office who are thinking, you know, I don't want to have to come forward right now and talk without a subpoena. And so they said, I'm not talking to you. I don't want to give the appearance that I'm cooperating. I don't want to give the appearance that I'm you know, Republican in name only and, and willing to come and, and talk about the election or acknowledge that it wasn't stolen. And so um, the subpoenas that, that the grand jury can issue can can help that and maybe give them a little bit of cover uh, as, as we go through. It's not unusual to have people who don't want to talk. The, the, the special purpose grand jury, though, it, when we talk about the powers that, that it has, it's, it's like a federal grand jury. That's typically the difference in the state and the federal system. The federal grand juries ha or in, have investigative powers. State grand juries typically don't. Most of the time, there has to be an indictment actually laid on the table, we call it. That is, the charges have to be laid out, and the grand jury votes on those charges. This is a case simply that the, the uh, a, a situation where the grand jury can sort of say, look, I'm, I, it's like an octopus. This tentacle, I might want to move it around here. I might want to hear from this person, might want to do that. We might want to think about this. Have you thought about this crime? But that's not something that's an anomaly when you compare it with the federal system. You just don't see it a lot in the state prosecutions at all. Um, you see it sometimes, but not, not very often. Just another unique factor in this case. And when you complicate things, when you make cases more involved, when you do things that are out of the norm, that's when you also uh, create uh, issues that can be heard by courts of appeal. And in this state, those courts are controlled by Republican appointees. Michael Moore, thank you much. Michael Moore, not the filmmaker. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> I, saw, I appreciate. That. I saw someone refer to you that way the other night, and it gave me a chuckle. Thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate it. It's good to be with you. You as well. An Alabama corrections officer said she was taking an inmate ch charged with murder for a mental health evaluation. Now both are missing, and investigators say she may have helped the inmate escape. This is the. It's what makes Subaru Subaru on this breaking news story tonight. Covering the policy decisions. We've got a great show for you tonight. My guests are John Bernthal and Falls in Rapid City. Cool, tangy. And even though the Taliban said it would bring security to the country and protect its often targeted minorities, like Shia communities, a series of brutal attacks have rattled several Afghan cities in recent weeks. Mosques have been targeted, especially during Friday prayers. On Friday, a blast ripped through a mosque in Kabul. Witnesses say 
There were so many wounded, it took hours to transport the victims to hospitals. There was a similar attack the previous week at a mosque in Kunduz province in the north of the country, killing at least 33 people. The fear so pervasive, worshippers say it's never far from their minds. I was very much preoccupied with thoughts and fear. I was thinking a suicide attack or explosion will happen at any moment now, or the mosque will be attacked. Not only me, but every Afghan has this fear in his heart. The Taliban condemned the attacks on the two mosques and also targeted recently a school and a learning facility in a Shia neighborhood in Kabul, where at least six people died nearly two weeks ago. The ISIS affiliate in Afghanistan, which often targets Shias and its rival, the Taliban, has claimed responsibility for several attacks during the Ramadan period. How long will such incidents continue? Afghanistan's situation is so bad. We have no secure place to live. Many are questioning if the Taliban government can actually live up to its promises to bring stability to the country. And so, as Afghans celebrate Eid this year, that sense of apprehension they have lived with for so long, it just continues. Our Damon reporting there for us. Well, let's take a closer look at the issue with Habib Khan. He's the co-founder of Afghan Peace Watch. That's an organization that is closely tracking security developments in Afghanistan. It's great to have your voice on this. Now, the Taliban, of course, said it would not tolerate terror groups on Afghanistan soil. A, have they broken that promise and or, given the number of recent attacks, can they stop terror groups if they wanted to? Uh, good afternoon, Michael. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. So, according to our uh, organization, we have uh, documented and reported 20 uh, bombings that include uh, side bombings, ID attacks, uh, grenade and mortar attacks uh, only in the month of Ramadan. So, that shows that the Taliban obviously are not capable of maintaining the security that they promised to deliver to Afghanistan. And uh, as far as the foreign uh, terrorist groups are concerned in Afghanistan, we had reports from northern Baghlan columns that the, um, the, the Chechen, uh, uh, Uzbekistani, and other Central Asian uh, nationals, uh, militants, are living under the Taliban, with the Taliban support uh, in the northern provinces of Afghanistan. And there have been continuous uh, attack by the Islamic State uh, all over Afghanistan. That includes the major bombings on some mosques, Shia mosques in particular, and uh, Kabul, uh, and also in, in other provinces of and, Afghanistan. And, and, and to that point, what do, you, what do you make of the targets so far? Mosques, but also schools. Um, you know, there, there are many groups operating in Afghanistan. What do you make of the rationale and the motivation when it comes to the targeting? Yeah, the bombing public places, uh, mosques, wedding, schools, universities, uh, this is the legacy of the Taliban. We've seen in the past that insurgencies uh, have been continuously bombing public places in Afghanistan. So this, sh this uh, really shows that the Taliban are not uh, capable of, of providing security to the people. Because back in the 90s, when they were in power, the only thing the Taliban promised, uh, the, the Taliban brought to Afghanistan was security. And this time, they are not even capable of, of uh, delivering on that promise. Yeah. Uh, th th there were, of course, plenty of warnings before the Western withdrawal that, that a Taliban return to power could reignite the very terrorist threat that led to September 11. Those warnings, of course, were by and large ignored. How, how then has the Western withdrawal impacted the level of terrorism in the country today? And, and would staying any longer have made any difference? Yeah, obviously, after the uh, collapse of Afghanistan and the withdrawal of the U.S. troops, uh, the Islamist groups, uh, other than the Taliban, uh, they have been motivated uh, in the sense that they could, uh, if they could defeat the U.S. in Afghanistan, uh, obviously they could defeat other governments and they could uh, stitch uh, attacks uh, like the 9-11. Uh, in, in, in uh, Western capitals and Western cities. So that has really uh, given uh, a moral boost uh, to the uh, militant groups all over the world uh, to, to uh, reorganize and to, to, uh, to, to try to uh, 
uh, take over garments and, and stage uh, hyperparallel attacks. How are some of the, you touched on, on uh, some of the international aspects of this, those, those uh, in the north and so on, but how, how are some of these terror groups uh, acting or, or, or might they act when, uh, in a regional sense? I'm talking about, you know, against Pakistan, Uzbekistan, we've seen attacks, or perhaps even uh, act against China in, in support of the Muslim Uyghur minority there. Uh, what, what impact could any cross-border terror have regionally? Yeah, so right after the fall of Kabul, we've seen a uh, surge, a significant surge in uh, the Pakistani Taliban, also known as TTP attacks in Pakistan. Uh, there have been, uh, like only in the month of Ramadan, there have been more than 60 attacks claimed by the uh, Pakistani Taliban. And they also announced the first ever uh, spring offensive, just like the Taliban used to do in Afghanistan. Uh, just before before Ramadan, the Pakistani Taliban said that they will attack and target uh, Pakistani troops, Pakistani military, and there have been uh, so many attacks uh, claimed, claimed by these groups. And uh, the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan, they have not been able to conduct any operation uh, against the TTP mm. because they worry that if they go against TTP, they will lose their foot soldiers because uh, th their narrative is based, their whole ideology is based on Islamic Sharia. And the TTP has been fighting along with the Afghan Taliban. And now they, if they, they go against the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban and Afghanistan, the foot soldiers are going to turn either uh, to Daesh or TTP. And that would be a huge uh, uh, loss, lose for the Taliban. But the Taliban have indeed agreed uh, with the, the Pakistani military that they cannot go up to the TTP, but they have allowed them to conduct target TTP in mm -hmm. Afghan style. And we, had, uh, we have had a couple examples in Khos that the Pakistani uh, aircrafts, they bombarded uh, Gurbaz and Gurbaz district, and before that, uh, another district in Khos province that killed more than 40 civilians. Now, you, you wrote recently that the... Is uh, like the Brown versus the Board of Education and Roe v. Wade, uh, this decision will change things. Continuing coverage on Morning in America. We'll see you tomorrow night. Some people have minor joint pain plus high blood pressure. Kids, wake up to AquaCare. The your doctor about all the medicines and supplements you take if you are pregnant or breastfeeding, or if you have kids. Sure does. I think she set up, a, it sounds like she set up a phony doctor's appointment to take him to. Uh, she had sold her house. She had retired or put in retirement papers. Uh, this is all looking extremely collusive, if you will, between uh, her and him. She was known as an exemplary employee with an unblemished record. She was just about to retire, and she helped in this escape. How does a corrections officer with almost two decades experience go down this path, Chris? Yeah, the, this is not, I mean, it's, it's not an everyday occurrence, but it's not terribly unusual. We saw this in Dannemora with the escape uh, uh, up there a couple years ago, which CNN covered pretty, pretty uh, aggressively. And, you know, it, it happens from time to time. Exposure to inmates. She was in a position where she was, I guess, coordinating transportation. That put her in, in con direct contact with inmates. They establish a relationship, and you know some, some people see the Taliban in their lives have already seen the West as the all, all the witnesses, and I, I've seen that it, since I came to the Senate, coming from the private sector, uh, I'm actually shocked at how much retaliation there is, kind of within government. Okay, and, and this would be within the military. Uh, are you aware of that? And it sounds like, you know, based on testimony, it's retaliation. Uh, certainly participated in by uh, members of Belfort staff, kind of in combination with the, uh, some of the folks in the military. I'm not aware of our staff retaliating against residents because they, they've expressed displeasure with our service. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Johnson. And, and uh, just to close out, I think it's... Someone who fits like a blue rubber glove. Just online, the doctor programs in the settings. You don't even. Then 49 years ago, when this monumental decision was made, here's a look back on how that news was reported. 
Today's decision came as a shock to both anti- and pro-abortionist forces. Well, it means that January 22nd, 1973 will stand out as one of the great days for freedom and free choice. This allows a woman free choice as whether or not to remain pregnant. This is extraordinary. For some women, this law will mean the difference between having an abortion or not. For many others, the law will mean simply having the abortion in their own state instead of traveling to another state like New York. This New York clinic, for example, reports that 48% of its patients are from out of the state. The attitude of the Roman Catholic Church in New York was expressed by Terence Cardinal Cook in a statement read by a spokesman. From the beginning, pro-abortionist forces have seen this issue as a question of freedom of an individual's choice. The freedom to have an abortion is now legal in every state. And here we are, 49 years later, more than a lifetime ago for many of us. Back in December, Justice Sonia Sotomayor asked this, quote, Will this institution survive the stench that this creates in the public perception that the Constitution and its reading are just political acts? I don't see how it is possible. End quote. An unprecedented leak involving one of the most divisive issues in this country, leaving a nation with many, many, with more questions than answers on this unsettling Monday night. But as our guest said, for those of you who are watching, who are planning, who have appointments, appointments for abortion services tomorrow, know that those appointments hold, you are safe. As of tonight, nothing has changed. And on that note, I wish you all a very good and a very safe night. From all of our colleagues across the networks of NBC News, thanks for staying up late with us. I will see you at the end of tomorrow. Just breaking in the last few minutes is this. The United States Supreme Court has voted to overturn abortion rights. Draft opinion shows. According to an initial draft majority opinion written by Justice Samuel Alito, circulated inside the court and obtained by Politico, the Supreme Court has voted to strike down the landmark Roe versus Wade decision. The draft opinion is a full-throated, unflinching repudiation of the 1973 decision, which guaranteed federal constitutional protections of abortion rights and also a subsequent 1992 decision, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which largely maintained the right. Alito writes in this draft majority opinion, quote, Roe was egregiously wrong from the start. We hold that Roe and Casey must be overturned. It is time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives, which, as Chris was just mentioning there, means re re returning it to the states and in... Um, more than two dozen states, there are what are called trigger laws, which would immediately uh, render abortion a crime, render it illegal, uh, uh, immediately upon the Supreme Court issuing such a ruling. Um, as Josh Gerstein reports, along with his colleague Alexander Ward at Politico tonight, quote, the immediate impact of the ruling would be to end a half-century guarantee of federal constitutional protection of abortion rights. It would allow each state to decide whether to restrict or ban abortion. It is unclear if there have been subsequent changes to the draft. This draft ruling that has been obtained and published by Politico tonight was reportedly drafted in February. Politico received a copy of the draft opinion, quote, from a person familiar with the court's proceedings in the Mississippi case, the abortion case, uh, along with other details supporting the authenticity of the document. The draft opinion runs 98 pages. The document is replete with citations to previous court decisions, books, and authorities, and includes 118 footnotes. The appearances and timing of this draft are consistent with court practice. The disclosure of Alito's draft majority opinion is a rare breach of Supreme Court secrecy and tradition around its deliberations. Joining us now is Josh Gerstein. He's the senior legal affairs reporter for Politico. He's one of the best uh, legal reporters and legal political explainers in the country. He broke this story tonight along with his colleague Alexander Ward. Josh, thank you for coming on tonight on such short notice. I realized that you didn't know four minutes ago that you were going to be on TV talking about this with me tonight. No problem, Rachel. Happy to join you. I'm not going to press you, of course, on your sourcing here, but I want to press you on your confidence in your sourcing. Um, obviously, this is a very unusual, if not completely historically unprecedented leak, um, a document that purports to be the draft majority opinion of the Supreme Court before they have issued any such ruling. Can you just tell us about your confidence um, in the authenticity of the document? 
Well, we're very confident in the uh, authenticity of this draft majority opinion, uh, Rachel, both in the way that we obtained it and other information that we got that supports uh, its authenticity and makes us believe that it is genuine. Now, of course, it's not a final opinion. It's a draft opinion. It was circulated in the court as a first draft by Justice Alito in February, dated February 10th. Uh, so it is possible there have been some changes since then, uh, but it's our, our best understanding of at least where the court stood at that time, which is about two and a half months after arguments in this uh, pivotal Mississippi abortion case. And you report, Josh, um, and again, forgive me if I get any of these details wrong. I am learning this as I'm talking about it, which is always dangerous. Um, but you report that the court uh, majority here is established, that there are, at least in the initial conference between the justices after the arguments, there were five votes um, on Justice Alito's reported side here. And the only uh, ambiguity, the only question is whether or not Justice Roberts would make it a 6-3 decision or a 5-4 decision if he chose to side with the uh, more liberal members of the court. Do you have any, um, wh what can you tell us about your reporting in terms of the numbers here, in terms of how the two sides align and whether that may still be um, a matter with some fluidity? Well, it's our understanding uh, from a person familiar with the proceedings that uh, Justice Alito believes and that the court has uh, five justices that are essentially aligned with this opinion that he's written, which is, uh, you know, just a withering takedown of the Roe v. Wade uh, precedent. Uh, it pulls no punches at all. It's pretty brutal. And in the way it's structured, it kind of needs to be that way uh, because of uh, the way Alito confronts this issue of a court precedent. Stare decisis is the, the legal term. And something has to be really, really wrong if they want to overturn it. And that's the case uh, that Justice Alito makes here. Uh, there is still some ambiguity about where Chief Justice John Roberts uh, stands, as many people noted at the oral arguments at the beginning of December, it sounded like he was finding a way maybe to approve Mississippi law, which is a 15-week abortion ban, uh, without completely ripping down the Roe v. Wade precedent. Uh, our understanding is that you know most of his Republican colleagues want to go ahead and take down uh, Roe versus Wade. Now that said, uh, we're at the beginning of May here, and this final decision likely won't be published until the end of June, perhaps even the beginning of July. So it's fair to say that this, you know, is a situation that is is unresolved at this point, and I can't promise you um, that various things may not change between now and late June. Uh, may not hold up to tougher judicial scrutiny. How important is it to you uh, as a senator, as somebody who's clerked at the court, who understands its importance that we find out where this leak came from? Um, CBS is reporting the FBI may get involved. What does the chief do at this point? How, how does this get handled? This is absolutely important that we find out who did this and that they received the appropriate amount of discipline and justice. I, I have questions about whether that person should ever be allowed to practice law. Uh, that's something that will be worked out in due time. But I do know this, Shannon, these are very small circles. As a former Supreme Court clerk, I can tell you there are very, very few people in that entire building who had access to the opinion. And uh, I'm virtually certain that there are a number of people inside the court right now who have probably figured out who it is. That person needs to be brought to justice and held to, to account for what they did here. Look, this is just a, the first in what I predict will be a series of other attempts to delegitimize the Supreme Court of the United States in the coming months. That's why I've written the book uh, Saving Nine, because I think their next step is going to be to pack the Supreme Court. They're going to threaten to pack the court, adding additional seats. They're going to do things like this, like leak decisions in advance. This has never happened before, Shannon. This is completely unprecedented, and it's completely unacceptable. Yeah, I got to say, I, I never thought that I would see this day because the court is very, very tightly locked down, especially when it comes to releasing these opinions. And again, we got to wait for the official one. I got to ask you, what do you think happens now? Because we expected this is, is a potentially a landmark opinion that could take well into the end of June, the end of the term, so that if there are dissents and concurrences and, and other changes to potential drafts, um, that it would be something that would be exceptionally well-versed and vetted before it gets to final form. What do you think the chief does now as far as the timing of getting this done and getting it out the door in whatever form it ends up being? 
You know, there's a part of me, Shannon, that wonders whether they'll try to accelerate the release of it. Now that it's been leaked, if it in fact represents where a true majority of the court stands, I, I, I suspect the court would be well within its right and probably well advised uh, to tell each member of the court, all right, uh, you're, you're going to have to get your, your ducks in a row here. You're going to have to decide which opinion you're signing on to and get that finalized by the end of this week. I think that's the only appropriate response here, because otherwise what you're doing, if you allow this to sit out there, you're allowing... Uh, this kind of tactic to work and you're incentivizing future unscrupulous leftist law clerks with an agenda to try to release opinions like this with an eye toward improperly influencing justices. That cannot happen, Shannon, and that's why uh, uh, while the court will do what it sees as best and it's, it's not my place to tell them what to do, uh, what I would suggest if I were in that position uh, or if they were asking me is to say uh, we're going to release it this week because this sort of thing can't be incentivized. Okay, let me ask you from the political standpoint, the Democratic Senatorial uh, Committee that is, is about getting more Democrats elected to the Senate says, if this report is true, this Republican attack on abortion access, birth control and women's health care has dramatically escalated the stakes of the 2022 election. At this critical moment, we must protect and expand Democrats' Senate majority with the power to confirm or reject Supreme Court justices. How much do you think that this is going to potentially impact the midterm elections? Democrats are going to paint you and other Republicans as extremists on this issue and potentially rally their base in a year that they need that. Yeah, you know, I, I think they're going to try to do that, and I think they're going to overreach. They can't help some, themselves in that regard. They've proven that time and time again. And I think that's going to make things even worse for them. And I think at the end of the day, you're going to see uh, more Republicans in the United States Senate, not in spite of this, but because of it and because of the overreaction by the Democrats. Again, they're going to try to delegitimize the Supreme Court. They're going to try to interrupt its procedures. They're going to try to threaten, intimidate and harass individual justices. Then they're going to move on to proposing that we pack the Supreme Court. All these things will prove disastrous as a matter of policy, but also politically for the Democratic Party as well it should. All right, Senator Mike Lee, thank you for your time tonight. Good to see you. Thank you. And you've been looking at a live uh, look there at the Supreme Court where they put up barricades. There are folks. Um, it seems rather peaceful in that there is shouting back and forth, um, but nothing beyond that that we've seen tonight. Um, but crowds showing up there as this news gets out. Um, we have crews there monitoring it, and uh, we'll bring you some scenes from what's happening there tonight. Um, the political fallout from this unprecedented leak from the Supreme Court already materializing tonight. Let's talk about that side of the story with Fox News contributors Guy Benchin and Joe Concha. Gentlemen, great to have you with us. Joe, I'll start with you on this media angle. To try to uphold um, the reputation of the court, whether you agree with John Roberts or you don't. Liberals don't like him. Conservatives don't like him now. I get it. Uh, he's probably the, the, the single most unpopular justice now in the Supreme Court, but he's gone a long way to try to uh, maintain the sanctity uh, of the court. Michael J. Moore, i got to take a break here. Um, thank you very much for coming on the program. Thank you for stepping in on a topic that we did not expect to, uh, um, to be talking to you about. We are going to... Uh, take a break here. I'm going to figure out if we're going to do more on this breaking news. We're also going to talk coming up about this manhunt that's intensifying for a confessed killer and the corrections officer who may have helped him escape from. If we will try and reconnect with him and see if we can talk to him, of course, about what is happening, not just in Mariupol, but also the developments we have seen on the east of the country and that offensive uh, as Russia continues to push in. Uh, we'll try and reconnect and see if we can reach out to him. In the meantime, though, I want to send it back to Paula Newton in Atlanta. Paula. Thank you, Esau. I'll take it from here. Russia's top diplomat drags out a conspiracy theory about Adolf Hitler in an attempt to justify the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and it's not going over well. We'll explain. Just sold my car with car gurus. Some misdirection. And this was actually an injury that happened at home. And maybe she didn't have a mm -hmm. safe place to be. Maybe there was more going on with her emotional life. Was she depressed or anxious? Without the time to address all of these other variables, many of which are the variables that actually led us here, and the physical injuries were just the end result of a longer term process, I felt frustrated that I couldn't ensure that she wouldn't return in just a little while. And then there was the woman who'd been in the emergency department for like hours 
with yeah. a critical illness. She wasn't feeling well. And the lab suggested kidney failure. That's right. And the family were like, you know what? We've just been here too long. Let's mm -hmm. go. Let's just go. So in that interaction, I'm sorting through all these patients one after the next three minutes at a time. And here comes a family member saying, look, for five hours. Mm -hmm. Can I take my mom home? We'll, we'll come back later, but we're about to leave. And here, when I so look at her chart in the computer, I realize that she actually has a critical illness, mm -hmm. something that needed to be that needs to be managed. That probably requires an admission and maybe a number of medications and potentially a surgical intervention to improve. And I don't have anything to offer. I don't have a medication that would relieve her suffering right now. I don't have a time frame to say that, oh, she'll be in the next bed in a moment. And in fact, when I review the list of all the patients in the emergency department waiting, not only has she been there five hours, others have been there longer and she might not be the sickest one out there. It's an incredible moment when you are the one deciding, well, who should come back next? How do you choose amongst all of these people who have so much need? And when you are and there are no good answers, what kind of burden is that to give people whose job it is to do no harm, whose job it is to cure and make people better? We all carry that weight really heavily over time. That one of the ways we've over time managed that is some doctors just look away and do their best not to confront these moral challenges or the recognition that there's so much suffering that goes on that goes untreated, justifies that suffering as a part of humanity. And maybe it's in some ways reasonable for people to have to struggle. And I think that I've gone through those periods and now mm -hmm. I'm at a point where I'm willing to just look at it and be uncomfortable. And I think that's part of what makes this book somewhat challenging to read is that I want the reader to look at it and know that sometimes there isn't a solution. Sometimes there's just suffering. And then it becomes incumbent upon all of us to figure out, is this okay? And what do we do about it? In the book you write, uh, just in the last who all say that they agree with Josh and his colleagues that this looks like a work product from the court, whether or not it has been or will be revised before it's ultimately published. And here is that this is, um, this would appear to be the day that, um, I mean, I, I was born in 1973, which is the year that Roe versus Wade um, was passed. Um, in my entire sentient life, um, women have been talking about the day that this would come um, and that Roe versus Wade would be overturned and that the United States would become a country in which abortion was treated as a crime and it was the government, um, it was the state that is allowed to decide whether or not women give birth. It's the state that is allowed to force women to bring unwanted pregnancies to term even if they, um, for the world's most you know, greatest or lightest reasons, don't want to do it. Putting the government um, in control of women's lives in this way um, changes something fundamental about who we are as a country, who we are as a culture, and who we are as men and women. Um, and if this change is coming not as a sort of feathered in set of reforms designed to ultimately undermine the right or make it less available like we have seen even over the course of this year as Republican controlled states have been advancing these newly aggressive policies and the court's been letting them do it. But if instead they're just knocking it out and abortion is going to be illegal um, in every state that will make that happen on their own terms or as the Washington Post reported just this morning and with this headline, the next frontier for the abortion anti-abortion movement a nationwide ban. Washington Post literally reported this morning that leading anti-abortion groups and their allies in Congress have been meeting behind the scenes to plan a national strategy that would kick in if the Supreme Court rolls back abortion rights this summer, including a push for a strict nationwide ban on abortion if Republicans retake power in Washington. That was the news this morning. They are working on a nationwide abortion ban to make it a crime. Coast to coast, everywhere in the country, as soon as they've got power. As Chris Hayes just noted a moment ago, it would be H.R. 1 or Senate Bill 1 if Republicans, in fact, get back in power. But to have that paired tonight with this draft opinion saying that the Supreme Court is about to clear the way just for that means that we are on the precipice of becoming a very different country uh, and our daughters and granddaughters living in a very, very different world. We'll be right Ultimately, in the midterm. A, f a, f 
a few more leaks coming, but but this is the biggest one, obviously. Uh, I can't see anything eclipsing this, but you know, you can't be surprised anymore. I, I'll leave it with this. You know, I looked at Gallup again as far as polling in terms of very simple question, are you pro-life or are you pro-choice? And right now, that's basically even split, 49% uh, pro-life. And if you look at the chart, it almost doesn't move. I think the media will portray this as, oh, well, everybody's pro-choice pro now. So, you know, this, this uh, is, is not going to fly. The country is right the middle basically on this Shannon I think that's something that when you watch the reporting yeah. watch to see how often that's mentioned because it won't be quite frankly yeah and also important to remind people if this ends up being what is at the heart of the ultimate opinion it simply sends this decision back to Roe and it abortions in the United States it doesn't mean that at all to make sure and clarify that if this is what it ends up to be people understand that it will depend in, in great deal where you live and who your legislators are that you elect